let's begin this part of our meeting, a panel of distinguished experts and myself. My name is Tomasz Durakiewicz and I'm a bureaucrat. At which point you're supposed to say, hi, Tomasz. That's how we start our bureaucrat anonymous meetings. This is a, an absolutely outstanding meeting of people who really care about science. And thank you for coming. Thank you for doing that. This panel of experts, we did um, pre-prepare a few questions. So we'll start with a round of self-introductions from the panelists. Then we move on to those questions. But we also want to reserve some time at the end. And I was told that we can go a little over an hour if necessary. Uh, uh, we would like to have some questions from the audience as well. So if you have questions, please remember them, write them down, and there will be a chance to ask. Uh, and without further ado, why don't we start with self-introductions of the panel, starting with Yelena. Hello, uh, my name is Yelena Steich. I'm an editor of Science Magazine. Um, I handle manuscripts in condensed matter physics and cold atoms. Uh, I've been in science for 15 years. And um, being a long-term editor, I've been um, involved in uh, uh, discussions of reproduci reproducibility policies, but also in uh, concrete cases of um, my papers going sideways and what happened with the, um, the the issues that come with that. Uh, and I'll be happy to participate in the discussion. Hi, I'm Carl Zemelis. I'm the Chief uh, Applied and Physical Sciences Editor at Nature, which basically means I run the team of editors covering everything that's not biology and a few things at the interface as well. Um, I've been at Nature for just over three decades now. Um, my own background is as a physicist, sort of condensed matter, but probably more physical chemistry side of things. Um, and during that time at Nature, not only have I seen an awful lot of papers, uh, I've also encountered more than a few uh, incidents um, to do with reproducibility, which have left their mark, hence the bags under the eyes. Um, anyway, uh, this has been a fascinating meeting so far. I'm looking forward to seeing how it moves on from here, and uh, I will pass on to my next colleague. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Laura Green. I'm the chief scientist of the National High Magnetic Field Lab, the MAG Lab, which is Florida State University, Florida, and Los Alamos. I'm also a professor at Florida State University in physics. My work is typically on the old kind of tunneling in, uh, in correlated electron systems and condensed matter. And so I'm interested in this because of things that I've discovered um, in my laboratory and other people's laboratory, and there seems to be some consensus, and I'm glad that we're getting together to talk about how to deal with this and uh, looking forward to how, what we learn. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Thomas. I'm the executive editor at the American Physical Society. Uh, unlike the other uh, people on this panel who have the title editor in their name, I don't handle manuscripts. Um, I, formerly, I'm the director of the editorial department, um, and so I oversee the editorial teams behind uh, the 17 journals uh, at, at APS. Um, and a big part of the work that that I do, and um, some of, one of my colleagues who's here joining us, the head of ethics and research integrity, is to think about um, how we handle ethics cases, how what our policies and practices are for the journals um, to ensure that we're putting the best uh, research out there that we can. So I appreciate being part of this group um, and, and learning from all of you. Hi, I'm Henry Lake. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Basel, which might mean you're asking why I'm here. Um, but I'm here to represent junior researchers. Uh, I mostly, I'm a theorist. I mostly work on device physics, where I think a lot of these problems that we've been discussing comes from. So uh, hopefully I can add something to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In in attempt to know you a little better, I will ask a few questions now. Uh, feel free to answer in in uh, in a general direction this way, <laughs> but also <laughs> uh, but also discussion between the panelists is more than encouraged, uh, especially if you have a, a hopefully controversial difference of opinions. <laughs> feel free to share that <laughs> with us. But first, again, in the, in the spirit of getting to know you better, could you tell us in your own line of work what aspects of reproducibility do you encounter most often 
which of those perhaps create most of your problems in your line of work and uh, how do you deal with those? So in relation to your own uh, work, how does reproducibility come into play? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this unfortunate position here. Um, so basically because I, I uh, handle manuscripts directly, it's uh, the times when I come into contact with reproducibility issues is when a paper of mine is not reproducible. Um, that is always, um, there are many reasons for that to happen. Uh, misconduct is just one of them. Um, occasionally authors come to us um, themselves uh, saying we made an honest mistake. The measurement that we did was an artifact. We want to retract the paper. That has happened, but uh, basically twice in the 15 years I've, I've been there. Um, then there are um, cases of papers that uh, basically were the researchers uh, did a good job, they collected correct data, but maybe they misinterpreted it because uh, they applied um, um, a, a physical picture that was too um, simple uh, to their data, or maybe there were multiple explanations and they uh, went for the one that, that was uh, proved, out, proved not to be correct, or maybe the samples were not as good as they thought. And uh, in those cases, um, you know, sometimes I hear um, at conferences, oh, that such and such a paper is not no longer considered to be valid for these reasons. Um, then there, there is also the sort of the most annoying kind, which is uh, that um, there is a, a, a we hear from other researchers there is a problem with the paper. Uh, there is a uh, they either cannot reproduce it, they cannot get data from the authors, um, and um, they are basically at a point when they can no longer. Um, proceed by contacting the authors and therefore they turn to the journal to, to help. Um, and finally, there are also some papers where, um, which were published on uh, one device, based on one device. And um, the, as far as we know, there is nothing wrong with those uh, papers, but maybe in the future we will find out that something is wrong. So um, those are usually the, the types of cases that, that we get. Okay, my turn. <laughs> Um, I think my experience pretty much echoes uh, what Yelena has just said, ranging from the whole the whole spectrum to honest mistakes, discussions, disagreements over interpretation, right through to the the really nasty misconduct cases. Um, so I won't I won't break them down into different different examples. I think Yelena did, did that uh, very nicely. I think a couple a couple of reflections I would have on the cases that we uh, we have experienced. Um, one is that not just the most extreme cases, but even the, 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 the sort of genuine points of discussion cases can often get very, very personal. And this makes handling them very, very tricky when people are shouting at each other, insulting each other, when actually there's a real debate to be had. Um, so taking some of the heat out of discussions about reproducibility, I think, would be would be beneficial. Um, the other general point I would make is in those cases where the end point is um, retraction of, of the paper, which I guess is the most extreme sanction that can be applied from the from the publisher point of view, um, I, I'd like to uh, dispel the impression that retractions are always bad um, or bad for the authors. Um, sure, in the cases where the reason for retraction is because of some dubious behavior or or, or or mishandlings of information or data on the part of the authors. Yes, the, 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 there is a, an obviously bad connotation with that. But some retractions are, uh, um, are of the much more innocent variety. Authors having made or being informed of an honest mistake they've made and on reflection feel they can no longer stand behind the claims of the paper they published. Maybe there's plenty of valid work still in that paper, but the main message of the paper has been sort of fatally undermined and where the, where the authors themselves either initiate or fully agree to the retraction to push that forward that should be i, sh I should be it should be seen as a positive rather than as a negative in that the ultimate aim of what they are doing there is to is to clarify the scientific record to to correct the scientific record um 
Could there be two different flavors of retraction? Well, I think that's a discussion to be had. But I think at the end of the day, the, the, a retraction notice is just saying that, you know, this, this is a paper that either the authors or the journal or both are no longer standing behind, move on. Um, there may be other investigations or, or discussions to be had following that retraction but uh, um, that that's the point i'd like to make there is not all retractions are bad um i'd like to start by saying i don't disagree with my colleagues science and nature say so that's great my my overview is coming from the research side i've i've dealt with my own misconduct cases in my own laboratory i've helped other people with theirs i've been you know asked to testify and different things like that and i i'll just say a couple of general things and just I don't disagree with what you said, but just to put it in really broad terms, there's what Langmuir coined as pathological science. And we're all guilty of that. That's making a mistake in scientific method. You believe the theory, you're not gonna count the data point because it was raining that day. And we have to guide, guard ourselves on that. And that's why we have peer review. And that's very important. It's really helped me in not making mistakes. That's pathological science. We're all gonna be guilty of that at some level. The other one, which I like to call psychopathical science, but that's probably a bad term, but it's premeditated directed fraud. Someone that decides to invent the data, invent the theory, not give the, et cetera, et cetera. And that is hard to prove, right? Because one thing that physicists do is we tend to trust each other. And that's where I've been caught up and many of my colleagues have been caught up because you're told, wait, that can't be right. And you go, oh, that person's not fooling me. So I've been studying this for years and collecting things, and I'm still planning to write my book. But what I've learned, fortunately or unfortunately, is I think what you said is that there's not a clear, it's not like a phase transition, first order phase transition between you know, pathological science and direct premeditated fraud. It's really, it's really a very vague and comes back and forth. You can be so egregiously pathological that you really fall into that, you know, someone says over and over again, you really got to check this out. You can be so pathologically, so egregiously pathological, I would put that into the premeditated. So that makes it difficult. And so I think we have to keep an eye on that. And I'll just say two things that helped me, it used to be three, but now it's two things that help me determine it. And that is, as we all know, and that's why I made decisions on these things before people like James and other people actually went into the lab and did the hard work. I made my decisions a little too early and not being quoted because if the data are too good to be true, they're probably not right. And where are the supporting data? That's not hard to do, to be honest, in the papers that we're talking about. The second one is publishing, not going through the journals like Physical Society, Nature and Science, you know, going through press release. To me, that's a sign, whether it's superluminal neutrinos or whatever. And nowadays, I hate to say this, but archive from a scientific organization should be treated as the press release. And, and so that's those are the two things I want to say is that um, too good to be true, press release. And the third one is that, you know, it used to be that overnight, if someone found a new superconductor, first it took a month, then it was a week. And now if you don't prove it overnight, it can't be true. But what's happened, and you know, I'm an old physicist that just fairly, you know, d d I don't have $10 million equipment. It's harder and harder to reproduce these things. You need $10 million worth of equipment. You need a lot of, you know, and now it's m more and more difficult to reproduce. And I think the people that are doing it are heroes and they need to be commended for it some way. Well, so I, I would say for sure the the editors that are at the physical review journals are encountering a lot of the, the same things that uh, uh, Yelena and Carl mentioned. Uh, for me, since I'm not on the front lines, by the time I hear about it, something pretty bad happened. That's 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 fair to say, or serious, I should say, that if it's come that far. Um, and, and then really it's a question of breaking down the problem um, and trying to understand how you're going to unpack it, because usually by the time a, a problem has escalated. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of emotion behind it. There's a lot of different perspectives and you have to really define how you're going to move forward. And again, I, I want to give some credit to the person who's sitting in the audience here from APS. That's our head of ethics and research integrity. Um, and he's quite painstaking about um, deciding 
how we're going to gather facts because ultimately what we have to do is fact finding. We have to step away from the emotion and, and gather facts. And ultimately our goal has to be ensuring that whatever is published, we can stand by. And that's true for the published paper perhaps that is under scrutiny, but it's also true for an expression of concern. It's true for a retraction. We have to be able to stand by a retraction and we have to be sure that we've gathered all the facts um, that are necessary to be sure that we actually should be putting a notice out there that a paper is um, not correct. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the start, I work a lot on device physics. I think many of the people in this audience, increasingly we, we work on devices. That means we have a lot of control but that also means that we can easily fool ourselves and also probably fool other people as well. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to devices, one problem is, as I think Elena already mentioned, that you can have one device that's a, it's kind of a hero device. You find everything you expected and mostly everything the theorists expected, but it's not reproducible. It does. It's only in one out of a hundred devices. I think this this is something that we we really need to to tackle. Um, I think on a wider point on that, I think in condensed matter, but particularly in device physics, uh, we've started fitting theory a lot more than uh, we we we've, we do in other parts of science. That so you you fit the the experiment to the theory, and I think that can cause a, a lot of problems. Particularly when then on top of that, you have journals like Nature and Science that they have a focus on story because they're for general audiences, and I think that focus on story can sometimes end up that. You fit the theory, you have some nice figures that, that that have a nice story, but not necessarily good science in there. I think that that's a, a growing thing, particularly as device physics uh, increasingly gets more important in time. Thank you. So, uh, Carl, you mentioned um, something, you said something about human nature and taking the personal aspects out of the debate. That caught my attention because I imagine that must be extremely difficult in, in the editorial practice. Uh, if I write a paper, I mean, I am the person I agree with the most, and I really like my papers, and I agree with them as well. So there is the human nature and personal connection to it that's difficult to separate professional aspects from individual uh, uh, irrational sometimes aspects. How do you deal with that? Um, well, the first thing I would say is the, the, the fact that the, the criticized author feels an emotional response, possibly quite a passionate emotional response, is to is to be expected. You know, their you know, wonderful piece of work is being called into question. Their thinking is being called into question. Their experimental capabilities are being called into question. But I think a large part, not all of the problem, but a large part of the problem is the way these concerns are put to them. Um, in the sense that many of the concerns or criticisms we receive are quite aggressive in tone and um, it's it's almost as if the person submitting the concern is assuming the worst from the fr from from the get-go um sometimes there has been some exchange between the two parties before they involve us and maybe that hasn't resolved things and that's why a certain level of aggression has uh, has uh, has arisen but on other occasions it's you know, we are the first pe people contacted. They've had no communication with the authors themselves, which I should, by the by, the by I should say, we always encourage authors, uh, as somebody with a criticism of a paper to first contact the authors, exchange with the authors, simply because a lot of concerns or criticisms go away at that point in that they, they are resolvable through discussion. Some point they may have missed some extra bit of information that they weren't aware of, um, but as I say, we when we get them in of, of that more aggressive nature, then it becomes problematic, and it's not mm. uncommon for us to go back to if if we feel that the the criticism has merit. Um, I mean, obviously, we won't pass on any and every criticism because we do get a lot which are, shall we say, not very well substantiated. Mm -hmm. um, we may ask them to tone, you know, tone down the tone down the discussion, re like remove the allegations of of misconduct or unethical behaviour, focus on the key scientific points. Then we can have a discussion. Then we can engage all the parties in the discussion. But even so, emotions do come into play, and that can make it tricky to process. Not least because it can prolong 
the process. People start talking past each other or shouting past each other rather than focusing on the key points of discussion. Right. Any other comments from the panel about that aspect of human nature? I just put that under the pathological science. It is human nature. It's it's really hard to deal with. You got to put on your strap on your NICADs, get into your robot mode, and it's very hard. Right? We're human. All right. So let's let's now switch gears a little bit. There was a lot of conversations in the couloirs about the new tools available to all. New tools related to artificial intelligence explosion, like Chat GPT and all the other things out there that really provide new approaches to generating content. Uh, but also are being extensively and increasingly used in generating epistemology. Um, your take on that? Um, well, that's a pretty general question uh, mm -hmm. because, as you said, AI can be used. Um, obviously, if it's used for nefarious purposes, it is bad. So, um, I mean, I can imagine somebody um, creating a whole paper or a data set um, just using AI, and that would be bad uh, but um if it's used in it can also be used in a positive uh, in a positive way if if if, if ai ai can if chat gpt can write better than you and if it doesn't change the meaning of what you meant to say then uh, and you say that it used it and how you used it uh, i guess it's not a terrible thing um, our policy regarding the use of ai has evolved somewhat we first forbade it uh, completely uh, because we kind of didn't know what we were dealing with. Uh, after that, we we um, changed the policy a little bit to um, allow the use in, in certain situations as long as the prompt that was uh, used to ask GPT to create the, the content is disclosed and everything has to be disclosed. I haven't actually seen that in my uh, the papers that I handle, but I think it does happen occasionally. Um, it cannot be an author. Um, the reviewers are not allowed to use it because uh, that can breach the confidentiality of the paper itself. And I think that's about it for as, as far as our policies. But um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a, com a completely op open question that then as just it, as human intelligence or artificial intelligence can be just used in 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 both directions. So Elena, do you do you run paper submissions through orig originality checkers or not? Um, yes, we, we we run them through uh, to detect uh, plagiarism, but not, no, not uh, as far as I know, not um, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, my re my response again is very similar to what Yelena said. So thank thank you for taking the question <laughs> first. Um, yeah, in in terms of uh, the, I mean, obviously we publish papers on AI, the usage of AI um, in a whole host of different contexts across all the scientific disciplines, not just not just physics. Um, where we have found the need to step in and and introduce policies are very similar to what has happened at science in terms of where where it's actually being used for content generation or content refinement. Um, so. In principle, there's no harm in an author using an AI tool to improve the grammar of their paper, improve the grammar of their writing. So not not content generation, but content refinement. But the you know the rule is it needs to be declared. We, we just just as if they'd used a language editing service for their paper. That is something we ask them to declare as part of the part of the publication. Um, it's a similar situation with with uh, uh, reviewer usage of AI. That's something we we did encounter a couple of cases which looked, let's just say, mighty suspicious in terms of uh, um, the reviewer reports we got, and and we had to start making it absolutely clear in the instructions we give reviewers they are they are not to run the run the paper through a certainly not through a public ai uh tool because again exactly the same confidentiality reasons yelena mentioned um and similarly although this is, isn't so much to do with, with with the science itself but uh um we forbid the use of ai in image generation for illustration for what, what whatever i mean unless the purpose of the science is the use of AI in image generation, in which case, obviously, AI-generated images would need to be part of that story. Um, 
looking further ahead, I mean, who knows how it's going to get used in terms of whether it's going to be um, data generation or or, or or what have you. And this is an evolving space where we, we're going to have to just keep a very close eye on developments, be alert to them. And if the tools become available for us to screen for undeclared usage of, of such tool, such tools and techniques uh, all, all, all the better. But at the moment, we're still in a learning phase. I'll try to keep mine short because I've been involved in some of this. I was involved in the NAS um, Open Science by Design. How do we do open access? And now we just published a week ago, I was co-chair of a PCAST report on artificial intelligence. And I just spent 15 months on that. And uh, we got all the slides, they're posted, the findings and recommendations are all posted. Um, our lane was to talk about empowering research, but responsibly. So it's called like supercharging research, et cetera, et cetera. And we talk about how, you know, you don't just let AI do the research, it's to, you're not replacing the researchers, you're empowering the researchers. Um, you also, there's a couple of things that, AI is really going to help with. One is sharing the resources. It's very, very hard. The low-hanging fruit, as far as any kinds of misconduct we can already do with um, plagiarism, is just scan the literature, scan all the data out there. You can get an idea if this is right or not. That's the low-hanging fruit with AI. So it will help us in, in both the shared resources, which is really hard to do. You know, How do you share resources when it may be you know, the federal government, you know, whatever, Homeland Security. And you don't want to share it because you want to pick the fruit of your own data set for a while, right? So how do we share that? I'm in the user facility. That's always a challenge. But it's becoming easier and easier to do that. Um, and then there's the responsible use. So you want to be able to share anything. But if I say, how do I make this dangerous chemical, um, all that data should be out there. But some of the data you might need a key to get into like census data, things like that, right? So so if you can look at these findings and recommendations, you can go under PCAS report, it's the top one right now. And you know, one of the things that we say is that it will empower our, res our, our research, but we have specific recommendations for responsible use. And some of it are what you guys just said here, I agree. Um, say if you used AI, um, just be clear about it. And the other thing that we're recommending, you're going to hate this, but just like we have to have um, a data, how we handle data in our NSF proposals, you know, how did you use AI? Just another, you know, boilerplate thing that you have to answer. So we're figuring it out. And I think that's something that we probably do need to cover in our, in our, um, in our report from this workshop. And Laura, a quick question. Is the report text available online? It, well, so yeah, if you go under PCAST reports, the report was published last Monday. If you go under PCAST meetings, you can get the, the rollout slides and Terry and me giving talks on it. So yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. So um, yeah, we presented to President Biden twice about this and um, uh, it, it's been very interesting. We had a we, there was an EO in January that he wanted PCAST to roll out a report in 180 days. We met the deadline within two and a half days. And um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so again, let me just say that there are many, many, many uh, people, uh, you know, workshops, et cetera, committees in the federal government that has been wor working on this for 20 years. So our specific challenge was we do have some mitigation things. We did put a memo out on provenance of, of uh, authentication, but this one really is about supercharging research. We have to do it, everyone's doing it, but recommendations on how to do it responsibly. And I think the NAIRR in the um, in NSF, you could look that up. I think they have, they talk about cross um, agency work and how to do the checks and balance, how to have open data and still data security. So it's a really interesting field. Uh, well, so policy-wise, uh, you know, physical review journals, we have the same policies as, as as science and nature. I think a lot of publishers kind of aligned around similar do's and don'ts. Um, and 
But then again, that's kind of all we've tapped into are the do's and the don'ts around preparing papers and what have you. We haven't really tapped into what AI could do that I think could really solve some problems. Even some of the things that we're talking about here at this workshop, um, you know, some of the things that 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 I was hearing colleagues here say is, you know, what kinds of things need to be in the paper to, um, you know, tell a researcher what was done to the data um, or like how many samples were, were checked. And if we want those things to be in all of our papers, then I could imagine that AI could be a useful tool to kind of like quickly scan through and say, well, were the right things included in the paper? Another thing we talked about in at least in the in the working group that I've just been in uh, was around uh, what kinds of um, like what how do we prepare the data um, and data can get kind of cumbersome right when you're providing lots of lots of information how are you going to sort through that that's a lot for a human to do but an AI tool could potentially go really quickly through that and really pull out what's mm -hmm. essential so I think we need to start thinking about how these tools can be useful for some of these um so some of these things that we really want to add to to the publication process and the research integrity process yeah so the the question was about new tools so I'll take that more broadly to just mean black boxes I think there's an increase in the number of black boxes that we have particularly in condensed matter physics when you look at some of these density functional theory uh, codes that the people don't necessarily understand what they're using them for. And I think that that, that can be quite dangerous, particularly when you have journals that the focus again is on, on, on just the story. And these codes can be used by people that it's hard to reproduce what they did and can be used to kind of create cartoon figures that, that give a nice story, but aren't actually creating good science. Uh, I think in the future, definitely AI will be one of those tools. But at the moment, we already have black boxes where we don't know what's coming out. Um, and it's hard to reproduce what's coming from from these things. All right. Thank you so much. A Vienna package comes to mind, which was used extensively to calculate strongly correlated systems. And we had a proliferation of beautiful structures that meant absolutely nothing. Speak up. OK. Uh, we did have a charge to working groups today, and really that boils down to two topics. One is identification of issues, and the other one, finding ways of counteracting them. So next question to the panel is, in, in your practice, do you have any good advice on how to counteract issues related to uh, reproducibility? We're asking you to provide solutions. How about that? <laughs> Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe next time you start. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start this okay. time. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, in terms of solutions, I, I, I don't think anything we do is going to completely remove the issue of bad actors when it comes to science and science reporting. I, um, there will always be people who, for whatever reason, will want to play the system and try and game the system to get a, a, a publicity advantage or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think there's a lot that can be done to just, in general, improve the intrinsic reproducibility of what's being published not just in the in the high profile journals but across the board um and i think there's a lot we could learn from other disciplines which have already gone quite some way along this path um thinking in particular aspects of the life sciences with their reporting standards and reporting summaries i'm thinking of the geosciences with the, the fair data initiative which is something that's adopted by not not just by the community itself, but is increasingly mandated by the by the publishers as well. So, um, I think there's perhaps a bit of reluctance in the in the. I'm thinking now specifically of the physics community to you know, change habits of the past, uh, where there is a long-standing reliance when it comes to data availability or code availability just to fall back on the old available from the author on reasonable request and what is what do you mean by reasonable who defines reasonable how do you quantify reasonableness in that in that context you know for, in most cases it works fine most most researchers are perfectly reasonable and are happy to exchange um exchange information but there's i think there's more we can do to Give that a, a more solid, even mandated base in the in in the publishing record. 
I'll stop at that point because I don't want to give too much away of what our working group have been talking about. We we came up with well, a heated discussion, friendly heated discussion, is that I brought up, you know, what is the policy of different universities and what was University of California, University of Illinois, you know, what are these policies? And, you know, I was based that David Goodstein wrote a book on um, uh, Tales from the Front and what how Caltech developed their uh, how they do their inquiries and their investigations for any kind of scientific misconduct or academic misconduct. And what I was surprised to learn is that we were disagreeing on definitions. So I think one thing, I think Dan was the leader of our group and we're like, oh, no, you're right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. Um, we said, you know, it's clear that we don't agree. And one thing that is true, we don't agree across public universities, private universities, national laboratories, companies, we, we don't agree on that. So I think one of the things that we might want to do is for future work is to try to just figure out how do your home institutions um, actually do adjudication or investigations or inquiries into these areas. Um, I was also asked, how can the societies, American Physical Society, AAAS, et cetera, do this? They do very little of their own investigation. They rely on the home university's investigation. And what they typically do in most cases is did the home university adjudicate this properly? And they have a vote of like three people. Um, so we don't, it's very difficult. You said it's very emotional. But I think right now we don't have the standards. We we don't know what what is the way these things are looked at at, at these different kinds of institutions, which are very, very different. No, I'm done. I, just, okay. I wasn't telling you how to talk. So. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I tend to think that the, the the best things we can do are at the inception of the research, um, that there's just a common understanding in any one research group, like what are what are going to be the checks that you have when you measure something that you feel confident in it. Um, one of the things we did talk about in, in, in my working group was just that everybody can have access to the data that's part of a research project and um, that's on a paper and everybody can stand by the data. So that means there needs to be some sort of common dialogue and awareness about what went into data taking and data manipulation. And I, I, I use manipulation in the, in, the, in the neutral sense, right? Like to convert it from what was measured to what was reported in a plot. Um, and, and I think that's really important that there's just kind of like a, a kind of level setting of what the expectations are and about about how you how you verify your measurements internally and learn and stand by them as as a team of researchers. You said you 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 share data data internally. Do you also share with the outside world? I mean, I think we're we're all moving towards encouraging that you know, step by step, I don't think it's a step function to get everybody to do that because it's not everyone's prepared to do it yet. Um, but I think it's around a kind of culture change that that becomes the norm. Maybe I can ask a question on that. But last year, the APS put out an editorial where they said that they knew that a paper was not reproducible with the parameters that were released in the paper, this, this PRB from Microsoft. Uh, do you regret publishing that? Because that seems a step backwards compared to, to where we should be heading. There's a PRB editor in the audience that he, he'd probably be the one. To... <laughs> but, but your name is on the, yes. is on the editorial. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so to be clear, that what's being said in the, the audience is that there is a remark that the this the the parameters will be released by the end of the year. Well, I don't know what that means, but mm -hmm. um, but at the t at this point, that paper is not reproducible, and and you say that explicitly in the editorial, and your name is on the on, on that editorial. That is that is true. So I will you know I will stand by PRB um, in the decisions that they make, and we stood by them um, for deciding to publish this paper. And what we wanted to make clear was that. This was um, creating a test for us in our policies mm. um, because they weren't really s developed enough to be able to say, no, we can't publish this paper. PRB stood by it. They felt that it was important to get it out to the community based on what they knew from the peer review process and um, their assessment of the paper. And what we wanted to tell the community was, 
we've put this out here, but we're really seeing it um, as raising some questions about what will be our our standards for what we what we require in a paper in order to let it go through. So we viewed it as opening up questions for us that we needed to resolve with future policy. And are you resolving that with policy? Um, yes, we are developing our, our data availability policies. Okay, so let me answer now. Um, so basically, the in the spirit of the conference, we do believe that greater data transparency will help. Uh, we require uh, the data that is published in the paper to be shared uh, preferably on Zenodo or a similar um, server um, um, upon public publication uh, in tabulated form. Um, raw data so far is not required to be shared, but it is certainly something that we wish, a direction that we wish to go into. Uh, we also uh, collaborate with Dryad, which is another um, service for uh, publishing data that is not uh, quite as, as familiar to the physics community uh, to uh, for the authors to be able to uh, make data available to the reviewers during the review process. So when you submit the paper to science, you can choose to upload your data and it will be made available to reviewers. Um, with all these initiatives, uh, something to keep in mind is uh, how much data you actually want to require, uh, what type of data, and um, what is reasonable for, um, and in what form it should be so that it is um, easier on the referees and on the, the readers to digest. And I think that's something that a workshop like this can help a lot with. Um, if you read our editorial policies, uh, you will see that we have some general guidelines for all authors because we published across all scientific disciplines. But you will also see that specific communities such as Carl mentioned, like the biomedical community and geosciences and others have uh, sort of specific stipulations because those communities follow those protocols. Physics does not have that. And uh, there is an opportunity to create it so that it can be adopted uh, by journals. And also not to shift the responsibility to funders, but it is extremely powerful for funders to have a mandate like that. Uh, it is then much easier for journals to enforce uh, the policies of data sharing. Another thing that we I haven't heard so much mentioned here is sample sharing. Uh, that is not, um, th that seems to be a, a sort of touchier subject. Um, it, 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 we sometimes hear about a paper that is, um, or, or groups of papers, you know, if, if the sample was grown this way, it will behave one way. If it was grown a different way, it will behave a different way. And, you know, you always just wonder, well, why didn't they just swap their samples and see what happens? Uh, because you don't know if it's the, the measurement of the sample that's making the difference. But that doesn't seem to happen. Um, and it will be nice if it happened more often. So to spice things up, we will start from the other end of the table now. Henry, get ready. Next question. Actually, it will be a segue from this part of the discussion. Because when you submit a paper, this special kind of bond forms between the author and the editor, kind of intimate bond. And it, no, seriously, it's based on trust, right? And, and that goes both ways. So the question would be, in the context of reproducibility crisis, is there something in this relationship on both sides that can be improved? And we're lucky enough to have both sides present at this panel table. Henry, go ahead, you first now. Hot seat. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, well, I, as not an editor, it's a hard one to, to answer to start with. Um, I think that that this this bond is, it depends on the journal, of course, right? That, that's the main thing that I think if you're submitting somewhere like PRB or, or even PRL, normally you go out to review, whereas nature or science, that's when maybe it's a more antagonistic bond to start with because there's a pre-screening of papers. Um, and I, I think some clarity, one thing in, in uh, both nature and science journals, I think clarity of, of what, what's going on with that pre-screening and, and why exactly uh, the paper is not being sent out to review could, could be improved. Uh, I mean, I, I can say from, from one 
experience that I had a paper that was not sent out to review because it was done at low temperatures, um, which didn't really say anything. So I think that that could definitely be something that was would be improved. Well, can can we expand the bond? Can it be a trimer? Can there be the referee in this bond too? Because I think they they're a part of the relationship. Um, because I what can happen, right, is that an an editor is caught between two perspectives, right? And so the bond needs to be strong enough um, that um, you can resolve conflicts, you can resolve questions. I think referees sometimes want extra information, and an editor has to play the role of deciding whether that information is is reasonable to request of the of the author um and if they do request it uh, then they need to be able to explain to the author why are they asking for this why is it worth making this extra step how is that factoring into the decision making so i i do think clarity is is important sort of that everybody understand um kind of what's going into the decision making and the editor plays a really important role i think in facilitating all of the different perspectives I don't know if I have anything to add except that our, you know, th these are great. I'm not a journal. I mean, I've I've been editors of journals before, but I think um, in this modern society, uh, Kyle, you mentioned fair data. We've talked about fair data. Um, is there a way to have that happen early in the process? So it's you know that I, I don't think we're there yet. I think like it's a step function, but can we have the fair data at the paper submission? Um, it won't happen on every paper. There are reasons why you don't want to do that. But at some point, when it, at some point, you do have to make it available. Um, we can investigate how much earlier in the process do you want to do it. If it's really, if it's really an extreme claim, uh, maybe you do have to get that early on. If it's one device, maybe you do have to get that early on. So I think one of the things we have to decide is when does the fair data have to become available to the public, to the editor to the referee, um, et cetera. Maybe I can jump in though and say, I don't think we should be publishing anything just based on a single device. I think we, it, it always needs to be multiple devices at least. I, I agree with you, but I'm trying to be fair. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll first pick up um, uh, Laura's point. Um, uh, wh where we do have these data mandates and the fair data in the geosciences is a classic example. We do require it at submission stage. Um, my editorial colleagues who handle the geosciences papers, if, they, if they've got one that they would like to send out, but the data have, have not been provided even for their use or the reviewer's use before they will do anything, they're back to the author and saying, okay, you know, we like, we like what you're claiming, but we need this included. Um, and so that, that's, and in principle, there's no reason why similar policy shouldn't be rolled out to other communities, but it needs community buy-in. You know, we we can help support that. We can help encourage that. But ultimately, it's the it's the for the community communities to decide what they want. And the Fair Data Initiative was very much a community driven uh, uh, driven policy. Um, regarding what Henry said um, about um, the, the the editorial black box of, uh, of of the highly selective journals, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with what you say there. And we do strive as far as we are able. And when I say able, it's not it's not just a, a, a matter of native ability, it's a matter of temporal resources as well. We do try to explain the rationale behind our decisions. Um, but such decisions based on effectively subjective judgments of importance for a field and how it relates to the importance of the other papers around it that we are receiving, it is subjective. There is an element of subjectivity there and there will always be disagreements. Um, and the one thing I will say, and I think people here, some people here already know that we are open to persuasion. We do get it wrong. Um, uh, we, we we know we get it wrong. And uh, we turn down things that with hindsight, we really wish we'd published. Um, but, uh, you know, the authors can interact. One of the advantages of having that direct relationship between the author and the and the editor is you can open up those channels of communication it doesn't always work in fact probably in most cases it doesn't work but occasionally an author will bring up something and, and it makes us the editors think again we think oh actually maybe we are missing a trick here and we should give it a shot and sometimes sometimes if we we'll offer a reason that is flat out wrong absolutely tell us 
So, Henry, any comments to what Carl said? Well, I, I, I think you also get it wrong sometimes when you publish things, but <laughs> I don't want to. No, get... no, abso <laughs> abso absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but not knowingly. Well, I, <laughs> I, okay, I don't want to get into this uh, superconductive business, but. Uh... Yelena, anything to add? Um, so yes, and, and as far as the the pre-selection process, and science has a slightly different procedure where we we have a, a body of scientists uh, called the Board of Hearing Editors, and they help us decide what to send to review. So that's um, um, it, it's again an imperfect system and also subjective. And um, um, however, the names of those people are public, and everybody can see who they are. Uh, we don't disclose who the paper was sent to specifically or their comments because they are sent to us in, in um, confidentially. Um, so we um, may paraphrase, paraphrase them or um, if the author requests um, to know a more specific reason, we can explain it. But in general, we do send uh, form letters for rejections before review. Um, the, this is the reason why we only review some 20% of papers is because we just cannot physically review all high quality papers that we receive. It's just impossible to do a good job on, on all the papers that do warrant review in general. Um, as far as the, the sort of the bond between authors and, 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 uh, and there is, it's true that there is a, you know, we're all human and there is also a, a, a trust is really important in that relationship. And when things happen where, you know, we believe authors when they say that they took the data, we believe authors when they say that they were representative of a, of a larger sample that they don't show. Um, so it's um, when things um, happen where where uh, misconduct is is uh, eventually discovered, that breach of trust is really uh, painful for editors as well. Um, so it is um, um, certainly um, a, a complicated relationship to be in, as you all know. And uh, I agree with uh, Jessica that the reviewers are an important part of that. I might regret asking this next question. And Henry will starting with you this time. <laughs> so there is another example of a, of a sacred bond in this sphere, and that's the one between the principal investigator and the funding agency, <laughs> right? That also is very special. So the question here is similar to the last one. In this, in those two sides of that relationship, are there, is there things that we can improve can the PIs improve? Can the federal government improve? I can't believe I'm asking that question, but please. I think Yelena already said it earlier that if uh, if you're required to actually be open with your data, et cetera, and that's coming from the funder, then that's something which, which can really change the reproducibility uh, aspect of, of science. Um, I, I think on the, on the other hand, though, we should be always cautious of overburdening uh, scientists. At the end of the day, we do want scientists to do science and uh, and, and not be just filling out forms all the time. So uh, it's a, a delicate balance between the two. So, but, but you're asking for clarity in the process, uh, um, well laid out and logical requirements out there. And uh, those requirements need to be doable in implementable in a way, right? I think also something that would be great would be if all funders had essentially equivalent rules when it came to data availability and all of these aspects, rather than it changing from funder to funder. Uh, and then you could you would know that at least you could then set up checklists and ways of doing things that you would know would be at least for a long period of time the way that you could stick to. So requirements from DOE would be similar or the same to those from NSF? In a way, I, I I don't work in America, but yes, okay. <laughs> it was the question how can the federal government improve? I thought I heard that. So. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm regretting that question already. All right, because <laughs> we could take this conversation in a whole different direction. Um, yeah, I I think this idea that the that the rules would effectively be kind of the same across funding agencies is a great one. I mean, you 
you heard that science, nature, physical review, we have same policies for pretty much everything. And that's because, you know, we don't, we don't want to torture authors, right? We don't want them to have to be scratching their heads, um, trying to figure out what they need to do at a, you know, from one publisher to the next. And usually the policies that publishers are coming up with kind of make sense. Um, so I think this idea that the the funding agencies would have similar rules is is perfect. One thing um, we were talking about in my working group is just how complicated it is to wade through documents that are provided by the government. They tend to be quite long. They tend to be quite detailed. And you just want to make sure that it's sort of user experience about going through all of that documentation when you're an author. You want to make sure, or a researcher, you want to make sure it's really easy to figure out what you need to do. Yeah, I, don't, I agree again. I don't have much to add except that the funding is is so difficult right now. And I, I think as a when I first started to become an academic, the first time I actually saw misconduct was people saying, "Ah, I got to get this proposal out. I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to put this data in, but I'm not sure it's right." Just you know, and so I think I I don't know what to say about that except that. You know, and you know, NSF just got this giant cut, and we know that this kind of research is really in danger, and we want to do it. And you know, we talked about in our working group, and we've talked about among our colleagues. Does this bring it to be successful? Do your data have to be better than they really are? And so, those are things that we need to address, and that would also encourage the fair data, and for for the funding agents as well as the right. journals to work together on this. So Laura, if I may, if I may just if I may just continue on that thought, would you vote for increased scrutiny on the side of funding agencies, increased requirements, or rather relaxing the existing? I, I'm really sorry about that, but probably increased. I mean, I don't hate me because we we're going to get a lot of arguments about we should have an AI paragraph in your in your proposals as opposed to the the, the data management paragraphs, but I think it's really hard now, right? If I, you know, these complicated that I, I don't know how to reproduce these data, you don't know how to reproduce them. You know, you're you're working in NSF. The the journalists don't know how to reproduce them. And now the other scientists don't know how to reproduce them. So we do need more transparency of the data, more scrutiny. And um, that's true, but maybe AI can help. So go ahead. We'll help. Go ahead. Well, I, I can't claim to have any deep insights into the uh, researcher funder relationship, but what I could say following on from what, what several of the comments leading up is that, you know, I do see the funders and and the host institutions having a key role to play in this in, in no, you know, not it, it's it's not not just the stick. There can be a carrot as well. There needs to be a way to recognise and reward researchers for good data practices, um, and and the publishers can play a role in that as well. I mean, thinking of of these data sets, probably the larger data sets, not the smaller data sets, but thinking of them as publishable entities in their own right, which the author can get credit for having curated it, posted it, published it, and it can get cited. It can. It, it, not only can it be more easily interrogated and used by others, they, they they get the benefit of that as well. So I think there needs to be the incentive as well as the stick. Yeah, I don't have anything very original to contribute, but yes, uh, I mean it's it's a sort of a we are all in the same ecosystem and we need to work together to make things better. Right on my end, I can promise you that the outcome of this workshop, of this meeting, will be taken back to at least to NSF and discussed and looked at by many, many pairs of eyes to think about the potential consequences for our policies.